The Virgin Coop, Act One, Ricky the Rooster. In the term of Mayor Fred Rogers, in the village of Make Believe, there was a chicken coop tour. A woman participating in the tour was caught with her hand in her neighbor's nest box. The neighbor, an unlicensed hen owner, along with other unlicensed hen owners on the tour, debated amongst themselves what they should do. One man said, we should alert the authorities. This woman should be arrested. But another unlicensed hen owner spoke up. If we do that, the village magistrates will discover our illegal chickens and take them away. Then none of us will have any eggs. So they were in a quandary as to what to do. Suddenly, there came flying into the backyard a brightly colored rooster followed by a flock of scavengering chickens. The rooster, sensing unrest in the crowd, hopped up on a tree stump and began to speak. Cock-a-doodle-doo, cock-a-doodle-doo, I say to you. He, with the most unlicensed hens, be the first to pay our beloved mayor a visit. And with that, the illegal hen owners, beginning with the most unlicensed hens, began to exit the backyard and make their way to the next coop on the chicken coop tour until finally the woman was left alone with the talking rooster. The rooster said, is anyone on his way to pay Mayor Fred Rogers a visit? Not that I know of, replied the woman. I think not, replied the rooster, as our beloved mayor has passed. But go to the village hall, submit an application to the magistrates to raise backyard chickens, and relieve your neighbor of his eggs no more. And with that, the woman kissed the talking rooster on the nose, who as suddenly as he flew into the backyard, flew back out, his flock of scavengering chickens behind him. The woman, alone now, heard the scratching of chicken feet behind her. She turned around to see her neighbor's three hens staring at her from their roosting bar. The voice of the talking rooster spoke in her head. Woman, where are thy scraps? And with that, the woman ran home, retrieved from her icebox last night's supper, and fed it to her neighbor's chickens. The Virgin Coop. The woman, Mary, did as Ricky the rooster instructed. She donned her red riding hood to protect her face and hair from flying forest bugs, walked the long narrow path through the dark forest to the village hall and submitted her application to raise three backyard hens. Constable Dooley Sworn encouraged Mary to speak with her neighbors concerning her intent to raise three backyard hens, then return in a fortnight to formally make her request to the village magistrates. There were four magistrates Mary needed to persuade. Sir Matty, Sir Marcus, Lady Lucille, and Lord Jack Beloved, accompanied by his ever-present sidekick, slash recently freed slave, Master Paul S. Flavius. Mary returned home and promptly spoke to all her neighbors whose properties bordered hers. All gave Mary their okay, encouragement, and unmitigated support. Some going so far as to hang empty egg cartons on her gate and leave small chicken trinkets in her mailbox. 
So delighted was Mary with the response of her neighbors that she enlisted the services of a shy and lonesome huntsman. Build me the finest coop for my three hens, and I'll give you the honor of spending a night with me you'll never forget. The huntsman, flabbergasted, had longed to meet the woman of his dreams, settle down and raise a family, but had yet to muster the courage to speak to any fair lady, much less accept such an offer from this one. This is the perfect opportunity, he mused. I will not let it pass me by. Perhaps the night will result in a child, and soon in this good fortune I will realize my dream. The huntsman accepted Mary's offer, being the gentleman he was, and built her a coop more splendid than either of them could have imagined. Not only did the huntsman build Mary a crème de la coupe, feathered with fresh straw, water, and feed, but he hid it under the cool breezes of a two-story garden deck, which he also built and likewise hid behind Mary's tall backyard bushes. The coop was accessed by a discreet break in the bushes and a cobblestone pathway fashioned by Mary herself. In addition, the huntsman planted a block of corn, a vegetable garden, and a small vineyard for Mary to enjoy from the top of her deck and later in the golden autumns when she could harvest grapes and handcraft small barrels of fresh wine. The huntsman also assisted Mary with various chores, odds and ends mostly. Mary and the huntsman rejoiced in the pride of the huntsman's work unburdening themselves in the froth of cold beer, Mary's frozen leftovers, and the splendor of an unforgettable night, as Mary had promised. All, however, was not well in the village of make-believe, which one would suspect, given the community as a whole, failed to anchor themselves into what was real. One Mr. Wolf, the husband of Mary's next-door neighbor, Martha, who had given Mary her support, harbored a deep resentment towards Mary, not so much because of her desire to raise three backyard hens, but because of her unorthodox affair with the huntsman. Mr. Wolf himself was a cockfighting loyalist who bet on the sport on weekends sometimes going so far as to host cockfights under a tent in a secluded section of his own backyard. The cockfights often lasted into the wee hours of the morning, inflicting upon poor Mary the strapped cutting blades of many a sleepless night. The last thing Mr. Wolf wanted was the attention of the authorities and the discovery of his deplorable animal cruelty. He also hid in his yard a dirty coop where he raised young roosters to be fighting cocks. What complicated things more for Mr. Wolf was his coveted desire to ravish Mary, for Mary was beautiful beyond words, both in body and spirit, and when he saw the huntsman win Mary's bed, it drove him mad with jealousy. This prompted Mr. Wolf to instigate within a handful of neighbors the deluded notion that Mary's request to raise three backyard hens was an inflammatory threat to civic pride and must be stopped at all costs. I'm against it, I'm against it, I'm against it, he snorted. These neighbors signed Mr. Wolf's petition against Mary. They were not, however, the unlicensed hen owners who recently participated in the village of Maple chicken coop tour, albeit underground. They, as a group, decided it was in their best interest to quietly ignore the matter altogether. They too secretly deplored Mr. Wolf's animal cruelty. 
We have no comment either way, Mr. Wolf. Good day. The day before the board hearing, Mary was gardening. Again, she was wearing her red riding hood, this time to protect her fair skin from the sun. Mr. Wolf, hiding in Mary's tall backyard bushes, leaped into her hidden garden. What are you doing? Mary was startled but not frightened. Why, Mr. Wolf, I'm tilling the soil around my coop to plant wire and flowers to make safe and beautiful a home for my three hens to be, Scarlet, Cantina, and Bella Rose. Do you like those names, Mr. Wolf? I picked them myself. Perhaps Martha has told you. Tomorrow evening I make my formal request to the village magistrates to raise three backyard hens. I truly appreciate your support, Mr. Wolf. Do you plan to attend? Mr. Wolf spit a thick vomit of iniquity. Wantin' to raise tree backyard hens, are ye? What do you want to do dat for? What's the matter with you? What are you, stupid? What are you, an idiot? Suppose we take a looky in that coop of yours, Murray. Harbored tree fowl hens already, are ye? The wolf moved closer. His horrid breath seeped past his venom infecting fangs. Kim, come, my sweet, don't be shy. Open dat roost box. Let me tick a ginder. Mary retorted. Off my property, Mr. Wolf. You, you, you beast. Mary ran into the house in tears. From there, Mr. Wolf himself paid a visit to the village hall spat in the face of Constable Dooley Sworn, broke into the village boardroom, the magistrates were having tea, and in front of the portrait of deceased Mayor Fred Rogers, swallowed whole the magistrates' free will, replacing it instead with his own obsessive suspicion that Mary was harboring three illegal hens in her coop of ill repute. Precisely how the magistrates allowed Mr. Wolf to steal their free will would later be revealed in the Supreme Court ordered Read It Yourself disenchantment sessions, each magistrate was ordered to participate in with Village of Make Believe's new avian certified psychologist, Dr. Peter A. Freewill, possibly the smartest man on the planet. Next morning, the four magistrates, under the delirium of the wolf's spell, each paid a visit to Mary's property and her virgin coop. Four conflicting reports were generated and presented that evening at Mary's inquisition. Lord Jack's report found Mary's property and coop free of poultry, fowl, or any non-customary pets. Sir Maddie's, Sir Marcus's, and Lady Lucille's reports stated they indeed witnessed one or two chickens either in or around Mary's coop. In a footnote, Lady Lucille's report stated that as she was leaving Petitioner Mary's property, some neighbors informed her that while walking in the village cemetery before dawn, they saw two figures exiting Mayor Rogers' crypt with a body. They inspected the crypt, found the door broken, and the body missing. Sir Marcus wasted no time with pithy platitudes. He whispered in the ear of Constable Dooley Sworn to launch a full investigation into the mayor's missing body, then made a motion to deny Mary her request to raise three backyard hens. In quick succession, Sir Maddie and Lady Lucille concurred. Three yeas to deny versus Lord Jack's nay to the contrary carried the day. Chomp! Off came Mary's head. Mary was sent home holding her head in her hands. As Sir Marcus escorted Mary from the courtroom, her severed head 
held high in her hands, protested as her body contorted in spasmodic gyrations. I do not have chickens. The portrait of Mayor Fred Rogers shed a tear. Back through the dark forest, Mary walked home, her head carefully bagged in her red riding hood, which she flung across her shoulder by the red hood's two long drawstrings. When Mary reached home, she was greeted by the huntsman, who was appalled at what the magistrates had done to her. Mary stood in front of her mirror. Will I ever get my head on my shoulders? I'll fix this, said the huntsman, who carefully removed Mary's head from her red riding hood, then placed it back on her neck. Hold it right there. Don't move. The huntsman swallowed Mary's red riding hood, then pulled from his ear as much red thread as he needed. He pulled a needle from his back pocket, threaded it with the red thread, then carefully sewed Mary's head back on. You'll be sore for a few days. Mary looked at herself in the mirror, turned her head this way and that. She admired the red stitching around her neck. She fluttered her long eyelashes. Is there no end to your talents? The huntsman encouraged Mary to appeal the magistrate's ruling, which he thought was entirely unfair. Through the Freedom of Information Act, he obtained for Mary copies of the magistrate's four reports. He literally pulled them out of his rectum. Mary was impressed. My, there is no end to your talents. The huntsman deferred the interpretation of the four reports, presumably to Ricky the rooster, who, next day, serendipitously, turned up in Mary's backyard, immediately after the huntsman left on a long journey. He never returned. Mary perturbed to Ricky. I did exactly as you instructed me. I submitted my application to the village magistrates to raise three backyard hens. And what did they do? They cut my head off. What's worse, my neighbor, Mr. Wolf, accosted me on this very spot. He then ran to the village hall, spat in the face of Constable Dooley Sworn, broke into the village boardroom, then swallowed whole the free will of all four magistrates replacing it instead with his obsessive suspicion that I already acquired three hens and was harboring them in my virgin coop. Can you imagine? On top of all that, the four magistrates each paid a visit to my property, and three of the four claimed they saw chickens. Hello, I do not have chickens. Ricky, I didn't say they would approve your request immediately. Don't assume they won't on appeal. May I see the four reports? Mary handed the four reports to Ricky, who read them while eating cracked corn out of Mary's hand. Ricky finished reading and laughed. Ricky, ha, what a riot. This is the oldest trick in the wolf's book. By the way, what's this about the mayor's body gone missing? Mary, I didn't write the report. You'll have to ask Lady Lucille. Oldest trick in the wolf's book. What are you talking about? And where's your flock of scavengering chickens? Ricky. Shortage of food supply, I suppose. Cause them to go elsewhere. May I read the four reports out loud? Mary. By all means. Ricky. Report according to Magistrate Maddie. As it began to dawn, I entered, by way of the village cemetery, the backyard property of Petitioner Mary, where I came upon a hidden garden and a large chicken coop. There, perched on top of the open coop door, I beheld a chicken. Report according to Magistrate Marcus. Extremely early in the morning, I entered the property of said petitioner Mary and walked into the backyard. 
I followed a cobblestone walkway through tall bushes and came upon a chicken coop with an open door. There, standing inside the coop, I witnessed a chicken eating from a suspended feeder. Report according to Magistrate Lucille. Early in the morning, I entered the property of said petitioner Mary and walked into the backyard. I found an opening in the middle of tall backyard bushes and came upon a chicken coop. The coop door was propped open with a wicker basket of flowers. There, inside the coop, I saw two chickens roosting on a cut sapling. Note, upon exiting Petitioner Mary's backyard, some neighbors amazed me. As they were walking before dawn through the village cemetery, they saw two figures exiting Mayor Fred Rogers' crypt carrying a body. They inspected the crypt and found the door broken and the body missing. Report according to Magistrate Jack. While it was yet dark, Master Paul and I entered the property of said petitioner Mary. Master Paul and I ran together through the backyard toward the tall bushes. Master Paul outran me and reached the coop first. He stooped in the open door, saw the coop was empty, but did not go in. Following Master Paul, I arrived at the coop, walked in the open door, saw the coop was empty, and believed Petitioner Mary was not harboring illegal chickens. I thoroughly inspected the interior of the coop's roost box, the nest box within, and likewise found them free of poultry, fowl, or any non-customary pets. Master Paul, who had just returned from a cursory examination of the upper deck, entered the coop with me and also believed. We left the property and walked back to the village hall. Mary, so what do you think? Ricky, you mean what do I see? Mary, excuse me? Ricky, the fifth report, don't you see it? Mary reflected. The huntsman pulled only four reports out of his rectum. Mary, explain. Ricky, we better go inside and sit down. Mary and Ricky walked through the back door and sat down at Mary's kitchen table. Ricky, the four reports when combined create a fifth report. The fifth report is divided into two halves. One half consists of the inspections of your coop described in the report of Lord Jack. The other half consists of the inspections of your coop described in the other three reports. In the fifth report, the magistrates described in the report of Lord Jack are encountered by the magistrates described in the other three reports, and in the delirious state of the wolf's obsessive suspicion, some magistrates mistake others for chickens. This misidentification of persons for chickens causes three of the four magistrates to believe you, Mary, is harboring illegal chickens. See it now? Mary. Whoa. Mary felt dizzy. Come again? Ricky. Place the four reports in one stream of events. Each report enters the shared stream of events at a different point. The sun's position in the sky places each report in sequential order. Lord Jack's report begins earliest, while it was yet dark, and the events progress through Sir Matty, as it began to dawn, Sir Marcus, extremely early in the morning, and finally through Lady Lucille, early in the morning. 
Thus, in Sir Matty's report, the chicken he witnessed perched on top of your open coop door is Master Paul from Lord Jack's report. Master Paul outran me and reached the coop first. He stooped in the open door, saw the coop was empty, but did not go in. In Sir Marcus's report, the chicken he witnessed inside your coop, eating from a suspended feeder, is Lord Jack, also from Lord Jack's report. Following Master Paul, I arrived at the coop, walked in the open door, saw the coop was empty, and believed. I thoroughly inspected the interior of the coop's roost box, the nest box within, and likewise found them free of poultry, fowl, or any non-customary pets. In Lady Lucille's report, the two chickens she witnessed inside your coop is Lord Jack and Master Paul, again from Lord Jack's report. Master Paul entered the coop with me and also believed. Ricky reached into his brightly colored feathers and handed Mary a photo. Ricky, here, take a look, a snapshot from Lady Lucille's memory bank. Read the caption. Mary, astonished. How did you get this? Ricky, just read the caption. Lord Jack and Master Paul roosting on a cut sapling as witnessed by Lady Lucille at her visit to Mary's virgin coop. The photo shows two chickens roosting on a cut sapling. Mary, this is incredible. Do you know what this means? If I can demonstrate to the magistrates their misidentification of persons for chickens, I will surely win on appeal. Do you think? Ricky, not so fast, Mary. The magistrates are still obsessively suspicious of you. They are still under the wolf's spell. Any evidence you present them will be interpreted in the wolf's favor. If the spell is not fully broken, I dare say you have much of a chance to change their minds, much less win on appeal, not to mention their distraction with investigating the mayor's stolen body. Mary coming unglued. That story, it's hogwash. Don't you see it, Ricky? Follow the stream of your own logic. The two figures my neighbors claim to have seen carrying a body from the mayor's crypt were Lord John and Master Paul leaving my property. Remember, it was yet dark. The village cemetery borders my property. At an obtuse angle, it touches my backyard. Obviously, the neighbors came to the wrong structure. The mayor's empty crypt with a broken door they claimed to have seen was the open door to my empty coop. Of course, the mayor's body was missing. My coop is empty. Ricky. Ah, the sixth report. Very good, Mary. But what about the body the neighbors claimed the two figures were carrying? Can you explain that? Three Little Chicks. Everyone at the banquet enjoyed Mary's meal immensely. They were quite impressed that Mary could feed so many, giving the growing shortage of food. A lady sitting next to Mary turned her head and inquired, Everyone has expressed so wonderfully their love for our beloved mayor. So what is your opinion of the man? The lady, nor did any village resident know that Mayor Fred Rogers was her son. There were exceptions to this. Constable Dooley sworn, the four enlightened magistrates, and Dr. Freewill. Mary wiped the corner of her mouth with her napkin, folded it, and placed it back in her lap. He was delicious. The lady turned away a queer look on her face. Mary stood up and addressed the villagers. Desert anyone? Mary whispered into the back of her hand, Crane de la Wolf. The lady was already gone. 
As for the investigation into the story of the mayor's missing body, it quickly came to a dead end. Constable Dooleysworn invested the mayor's crypt and found nothing amiss. The door could only be opened with the permission of the mayor's immediate family, which of course was Mary. Mary won the appeal. The magistrates gave Mary their wholehearted approval, undying support, and a beautifully framed license to raise three backyard hens, gracefully adorned with the signatures of all four magistrates. Mary, overjoyed, went home and gave birth to three little chicks. She spared Ricky the rooster the fate of most chickens, turning him instead into a faithful coop master who raised Scarlet, Cantina, and Bella Rose into productive hen layers. Because of Mary's tireless efforts to promote backyard chickens, thereby increasing the village food supply, the village of make-believe survived the famine, renounced its superstition, and prospered under a new name, Village of Fresh Eggs. Dr. Freewell moved on to a new village and continued his work there. He left a piece of himself with Mary she treasured. In the beginning was the doodle, and the doodle was made meat, and the meat scratched among us. Note, the explanation of the sightings of chickens at Mary's virgin coop is an adaptation of Joseph Atwill's Chapter 7, The Puzzle of the Empty Tomb. Caesar's Messiah, the Roman Conspiracy to Invent Jesus, Flavian Signature Edition, 2011. These are the words of Robert Rosewood.